Welcome to the third installment of Black Cat Theology, a series of lectures devoted to the later philosophy of Martin Heidegger and its possible relevance to contemporary theology. My name is Dr. Peter Dillard, and these lectures are based on material in my book, Non-Metaphysical Theology After Heidegger, that has just been published by Palgrave Macmillan. In the last lecture, we saw that from the welter of remarks in Heidegger's later writings about beings, the non-metaphysical event of being or Reignis in German, and the holy, several different possible ways of thinking about the interrelations among beings, being, and the holy emerge. Remember that initially it looked like there was no coherent view being set forth, but upon closer inspection it became apparent that more than one is. So, if you will, there's an embarrassment of riches here. Last time we examined two of these views, or what I called proto-theologies, which are kind of blueprints for thinking about the interrelation among beings, being, and the holy. We also saw that in each case there are serious problems with the proto-theology in question that arise from considerations that are present in Heidegger's later writings themselves. The first proto-theology claims that God, or the holy, is not being itself, but is a particular being, that is, a divine being, in contradistinction to non-divine beings, like a, a fox, or a tree, or a human being, an ordinary human being. Now the problem with this proto-theology, this first one, is that Heidegger fails to explain what it is that makes this particular being, that is, God, the Holy, a divine being, as opposed to a non-divine being like the ones that I just mentioned. That is, he fails to explicate the difference between divinity and non-divinity insofar as that's applied to beings. The most natural way of explaining that distinction comes from medieval metaphysics. According to that, for something to be is for it to have an ultimate explanation. For something to be non-divine, for a particular being to be non-divine is for it to have its ultimate explanation in God, in something else. That is, God as first cause, or creator, and sustainer. Whereas God, that being, has its uh, ultimate explanation in itself as cause is sweet. Where, what that means is not that God creates himself out of nothing, but that God is a necessary being, that the divine essence is a necessary, is a necessary fact. Okay? Now, the problem here is that Heidegger, in his later writings in particular, is very antagonistic or hostile to any metaphysics. He wants to overcome all metaphysics, as he puts it. And so for that reason, he cannot avail himself, consistently at least, of this metaphysical explanation that I just described. This comes from medieval philosophy, medieval metaphysics. Moreover, he doesn't provide any other account of the distinction between divine and non-divine insofar as that's applied to beings. So that's a serious problem with the first proto-theology. Now, the second proto-theology has it that God, or the holy, is not a particular being but rather is identical with being itself, or being here is understood as this non-metaphysical event of arrigness or appropriation. Now this second proto-theology is also highly problematic because it seems to imply either that all beings are divine, that they're all gods, or that no being is divine. There's no such thing as any god. So let's look at the first apparent consequence. If all beings have being, and so if being itself is the same as the holy, then it would follow that all beings, including a fox and a human being or a tree or a leaf, all of those things insofar as they have being, where being is the same as the holy, are also holy. And so they would all be gods. That's a very counterintuitive polytheism that Heidegger would reject. Remember, he says we don't count gods, and so that's not available to him either. On the other hand, Insofar as God is holy, and holy is the same as the ordinary being that all those uh, ordinary beings I just described possesses, then it looks like God himself has purely ordinary being, that in which case he's not divine. He's not a God. He's no more divine insofar as he possesses being, which is the same as the holy, 
he's no more divine than a fox is or a tree is or an ordinary human being is. So that's also a problematic consequence. Additionally, there's another problem with the second proto-theology, and that is that Heidegger distinguishes between the non-metaphysical event of being and beings, on the other hand, and the holy. He makes a distinction between those within that uh, by saying that non-metaphysical being is a measure or a metron. It is the measure or the metron of not only beings, but also of the holy, the last god. Now, since a measure cannot is not the same thing as what it measures, then it becomes quite clear that the non-metaphysical event of being, insofar as it's a measure of the holy, is not the same as the holy. So once again, we see that there are considerations internal to Heidegger's later thinking that militate against the second proto-theology. What I want to do in this lecture is examine a third proto-theology that we can extract from Heidegger's later writings. I want to argue that this proto-theology is superior to the other two because it avoids the problems with them. Nevertheless, we're going to see that this proto-theology also faces a formidable obstacle that will need to be overcome if we are to establish any kind of fruitful relationship between it and theological concerns, full-blown theological concerns. So let's consider this third proto-theology. Now, according to that, this third proto-theology, the holy, that is God, the holy is neither a particular being, nor is the holy being itself, the non-metaphysical event of being. This view is suggested in the following passage from Heidegger's contributions to philosophy. He says, To be sure, the event must never be represented immediately and objectively. The appropriation is the oscillation between humans and gods, and is precisely this between itself and its essential occurrence, which is grounded through and in Dasein. The God is neither a being nor a non-being, and also is not to be identified with being, the non-metaphysical event of Reignus. So that's a very clear statement, very different proto-theology from the other two we've just described. Now, Heidegger goes on to make another claim. Not only is the holy different from being, the non-metaphysical event of being, and beings, he also says this, being must be thought out to this extremity. It thereby illuminates itself as the most finite and richest, the most abyssal of its own intimacy. For being is never a determination of the God as God. Rather, being is that which the divinization of the God needs so as to remain, nevertheless, completely distinct from it. So Heidegger claims that the holy, with the divinization of the God, that needs being, the non-metaphysical event of being, as something distinct from it. So that's a very interesting claim. He doesn't explicate it here, the precise sense in which the holy needs being. That's something that we will be addressing later in the lecture series. But that's, that's an, additional part, an additional part of this third proto-theology. Heidegger also makes the reciprocal claim that, or at least he implies, that it's also the case that this non-metaphysical event of being needs the holy. At another place in the Contributions to Philosophy, he writes, the gods do not need being as their proper domain in which they themselves find a place to stand. So in some sense, they, the gods or the holy has a kind of independence from being. And moreover, Heidegger writes, this essential occurrence of being is not itself the last god. Instead, the essential occurrence of being grounds the sheltering and thereby the creative preservation of the God who pervades being with divinity, always only in work, deed, and thought. I'm sorry, always only in work, sacrifice, deed, and thought. And at another place he says that only then, only when that happens, can being form the net in which the last God is self-suspended in order to rend the net, and let it end in its own uniqueness, divine and rare and the strangest amid all beings. So here being is the net, and it's as if being needs the God in order for being itself to become divinized, in order to end divine and rare and the strangest amid all beings. So that would suggest that 
not only does the holy need being in some sense, there's a, another sense in which being needs the holy. So, once again, in the pr third prototheology, then, the, the holy is neither being, the non-metaphysical event of being, nor beings. There's a sense in which being is somehow supposed to need the holy, and also a reciprocal sense in which the holy needs being. That's very different. Now, notice that immediately we can say that this third prototheology, at least in principle, avoids the problems with the other two, because it doesn't take, it does not identify the, the holy with a particular being. And so there's no need, you know, Heidegger doesn't need to get into the problem of, well, what is it that makes this particular being holy or divine, because it isn't a being at all. Moreover, he also, in distinguishing between the non-metaphysical event of being and the holy, doesn't face the problems with the second prototheology, problems which turn upon that identification. So here, there is a pref there is a clearly an advantage, at least in the space of reasons, and kind of abstractly, there's an advantage that this third prototheology has over the other two. Now, let, let's look at this idea that, in some sense, the, the non-metaphysical event, event of being needs the holy, and the holy needs the non-metaphysical event of being. Now, Heidegger doesn't really say a lot about what that is. He, he leaves it rather vague and abstruse. So, when Heidegger talks about, let's say, the non-metaphysical event of being needing the holy, Sometimes this, this notion of needing is connected in other contexts with sh what he calls sheltering, right? So we know that, for example, in uh, Origin of the Work of Art, Heidegger talks about how different artworks, like the Greek temple or the pair of peasant shoes painted by Van Gogh, sh that, that they can shelter non-metaphysical being. In, the, in other words, they can become occasions to sort of anchor that and help us to think about it in a way that avoids metaphysical distortion. So presumably he thinks that there's the sense in which the non-metaphysical event of being needs the holy, in addition for it to in addition to the fact that it needs to be sheltered in beings, it also needs to be sheltered in a non-being, that is the holy. If there's going to be a complete sheltering of non-metaphysical being, a complete what we might say divinization, since it involves that, then this non-metaphysical event, whatever it is, it has to be sheltered not only in beings, he also mentioned, remember just a minute ago, work, sacrifice, deed, and thought, or works of art, but it also needs, those are all beings, but it also needs to be sheltered in the, the, a non-being, something that's not a being. Now, what, is that, what could that possibly mean? Presumably, Heidegger does not have in mind when he's talking about the holy as a non-metaphysical being, he's not talking about ordinary non-metaphysical beings like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny, because those things don't shelter being. They, they don't shelter anything. They're just fictions. And he, whatever the, the sense in which the last god or divinity or the god, the holy, is a non-being, it's not like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny, because those, that doesn't shelter anything. Those are just folk tales. Those are just stories. This is supposed to, this non-being that the holy is, is supposed to engage in the same kind of sheltering that beings do vis-a-vis -vis the non-metaphysical event. Now, the problem here is that Heidegger doesn't in any place explain what this non-metaphysical, the sheltering of non-metaphysical being in the holy is. He gives a lot of attention, devotes a lot of space in, in various places in his later writings to explaining how beings can shelter non-metaphysical being. At not one place, at least according to my uh, familiarity from what I can see in Heidegger, I, I cannot think of one place where he goes on at length, or at all for that matter, about how the God, the last God or divinity as a non-being shelters or or the non-metaphysical event of being. So he leaves that complete, completely ex unexplicated. Now, what we have then, the upshot of this, it seems to me, is that Heidegger has given us a third prototheology that is preferable to the first two, but it's simply, so far, a 
position and bare position in logical space. It doesn't have any real content yet. It 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 doesn't really have any experiential content. It doesn't really have any phenomenological substance or veracity. It's simply something that we can almost say is in kind of a debater's point. Well, look, by distinguishing the holy from any particular being or from non-metaphysical being itself, Heidegger avoids all these other problems with the first two proto-theologies, but then he doesn't really explain how this proto-theology um, has any experiential content, especially when it comes to explaining how this third proto-theology uh, explicates the idea that, well, this notion of the holy, in addition to being a uh, needing being, being also needs the holy as, an, as some kind of non-being in order to sh be sheltered or to become divinized. Heidegger doesn't explain that. And another way of putting this point is that a criticism that Heidegger makes in his lecture, Identity and Difference, against sort of traditional notions of God as the cause of sui or first cause, the same kind of criticism that he makes against that could be made against this third proto-theology. He says in that lecture at one point, well, look, this metaphysical notion of God is a first cause. Nobody can bend the knee before that or worship before that, worship that or dance before that. It's just so completely abstruse and without any substantive content, phenomenological and experiential content, that it really it doesn't make any sense or it, it, it just isn't something that we can really take seriously. It's just completely abstruse. But the same thing can be said now about this third proto-theology. It doesn't really explain how these various notions, being, beings, and in particular the holy, are connected to experience, human experience. So it looks like, just as with the notion, this metaphysical notion of God as first cause, the notion of the holy as something distinct from non-metaphysical being, as well as from any particular being, something that the non-metaphysical event needs, and something that also needs the non-metaphysical event, is entirely abstruse and empty of any kind of real experiential content. So that's the formidable obstacle with the third proto-theology that I wanted to describe today. In the next lecture, we're going to begin to address that concern. We're going to look at places in Heidegger's later writings where he describes what might be called the human experience in the face of the holy. What is it like to purport, at least, to encounter the holy? What is that like? What kind of experience is that? And we're going to see that, interesting, interestingly, Heidegger presents two very different kind of phenomenological ways of filling out this rather abstract and abstruse third proto-theology. So that's promising because that might give the theologian who's interested in Heidegger's later theology more grist for the mill. But we're going to have to wait until next time to see how that begins to work out. So once again, thank you for joining me today, and I hope that you'll tune in next time. This is Black Cat Theology signing off. Thank you very much.